Good morning. Whoa. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Patrick Dunn. Patrick is a career-long RT with over 40 years of experience in all aspects of respiratory care practice, following many years of voluntary service at the local and national level, he served as president of the AARC and continues to serve the profession in 2018 as members of the President's Council, as the 2018 AARC representative to the International Council for Respiratory Care. Patrick is now recognized as a leading authority on the impact of the 2010 Affordable Care Act on the traditional practice of respiratory care and what it means to you, the patient. So let's give him a warm welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Joanne. I hope you can all hear me now. I'm, I tend to wander, so they had to hook me up with this wandering mic, and uh, I wanted to make sure that I could be heard. Uh, by all of you because we want to make the most important part of this, which is the Q&A afterwards. And uh, I have my trusty watch out here. I will also stay on time because I'm kind of the person between you, lunch and yoga. And I don't want to definitely be an obstacle to that enjoyment part of the day. So I will promise you to stay on target. First, a couple of disclosures. The AARC is our professional association. It's the American Association for Respiratory Care. And it's the association that respiratory therapists belong to. And the whole purpose of the AARC is to promote fair and unqualified access to respiratory care no matter where it needs to be practiced. So we're a patient advocacy group. And we work in Washington, and we work at the state level to try and get legislation passed to improve the care and access for respiratory care. Now with that in mind, let me go ahead and tell you what the plan is for the next 45 minutes before we get into the, uh, uh, what do we want to say, the Q&A and the yoga. First of all, I'm going to review the benefits of what is known as traditional Medicare. And I'm also going to give you some important dates for the 2019 year that's about to come into play in about two and a half, three months. At the same time, I'm also going to explain to you the recent changes in Medicare for hospital care for COPD and also for home care for COPD. And the reason I'm bringing up hospital care is because hospitals are under a lot of pressure these days from Medicare to kind of do things differently. And I want to make sure that you're aware of what your rights are as a Medicare recipient, and most of my presentation is going to be geared toward Medicare, let me disclose, I am on Medicare, so I know from whence I speak, and it's awfully hard for me to keep up. And so I wanted to be able to provide you of how a way that you'll be able to continue to keep up after today and have a resource where you can get your questions answered and also where you can go to find out more information about your Medicare benefits and what opportunities you have. Uh, I have to be, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge not only Dr. Petty, who in my mind was one of my greatest, greatest uh, teachers and influencers and motivators. I had a chance to work with Dr. Petty off and on for about 25 years, both in the United States. And I must tell you what was really practical is when we went overseas together, how which high reverence he was held in in other parts of the world because of his pioneering work in COPD. And also to the uh, right of that slide is John Walsh, who recently passed away. He is an Alpha One, was an Alpha One patient, and he started the COPD Foundation. And what he found, what he wanted that foundation to do was to direct the government and other agencies to spend more money on research to explore better ways to not only diagnose COPD, but to help prevent COPD and to better treat COPD. And the COPD Foundation is a very important part of the landscape, and we owe a debt of gratitude to both of those gentlemen who are no longer with us. All right, now, there are people, as we saw by a show of hands, this is their first time here. And I was delighted to be here about two years ago to kind of give an update on the Medicare program. And so to make sure that we don't lose anybody, I'm going to take about 10 minutes and just kind of review what is known as the traditional Medicare program today. And there are four parts, and they're all followed by a letter. So there's Medicare Part A, which is referred to as hospital insurance. 
And we'll talk more about Part A and what it means and what the benefits are in a moment and how much it's going to cost you. And then there's Medicare Part B, which is known as the medical insurance. And that's a companion to Medicare Part A, as we'll see, to cover what Medicare Part A does not cover, which is basically services that are rendered outside of the hospital. And then there's Medicare Part C, which is not the newest, but almost the newest, where Medicare is actually signing contracts with hospitals and physicians as a group to try and have them provide all of the care that a Medicare patient needs in that particular geography. And I'll explain what that means and what your rights and responsibilities are should you go down that road. And then the last and the newest form of Medicare coverage was Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit, Part D, that was signed into law in 2003 and actually became effective in 2006. And that's a very important because that prescription drug benefit is something that we all hold very dearly, but at the same time there are some challenges with that which we'll talk about. All right, now let's look at Medicare Part A. Medicare Part A, they call it hospital insurance. There's no premium. When you turn 65 after having worked so many years in the United States, you're going to have paid into the Medicare trust fund from your, Medicare, from your so, uh, payroll withholding. And if you've had so many quarters paid into the Medicare system, when you turn 65, you're automatically eligible for the hospital insurance or Medicare Part A, and there's no premium. In other words, it is a free bonus that you've actually paid for over the years that you've been working. And what this does, it pretty much covers, as I listed on the screen up here, and I have my green pointer, all your hospital care when you're admitted to the hospital. It also will provide so many days in a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home once you leave the hospital if you qualify for it. Also under Part A, what they call home health care services, where you're going to be eligible for a certain number of skilled visits in the home provided by a skilled nurse, a, a public health nurse, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a medical social worker, a speech therapist. They come into the home, render care, and they leave. And there are so many visits that are approved depending upon your condition. Respiratory therapists are not included in that benefit. And the reason is, is that when this benefit was developed and signed into law in 1965, the respiratory therapy profession was just starting to gain momentum in the United States. So that's why we're not part of that intermittent home health visit prescription. And at the same time, it also provides hospice care for people who are actually in the end stages of their life, depending upon what their disease. Notice here, what happens is after you meet your deductible, Medicare Part A pays 100% of what the bill is that Medicare approves for your hospital stay, for your skilled nursing facility, and for your intermittent skilled visits. So it's really a very nice healthy benefit, but it's all predicated on going into the hospital. Now at the same time, I mentioned that the companion to that is Medicare Part B. And Medicare Part B is called medical insurance, and it was primarily designed to cover the cost of the physician services that the physician fees would be paid for for services they provided in their office, in the clinic, or in the hospital. However, unlike Medicare Part A, this is not free. You have to pay for this. And the cost in 2018 is about $134 a month if you're not employed, as a, if you're still not working after you retire. If you continue to work, that benefit premium might be a bit higher. At the same time, what this pays for, it pays for 80% of what Medicare approves. But look at the list of what's covered. It's called covering your doctor services. It covers your outpatient services, and that includes the emergency department when you go to the ED, outpatient clinics, radiology, lab work, and outpatient physical therapy. At the same time, it also covers the x-rays and laboratory. And then down here, which gets our attention, is what we call durable medical equipment. It pays for the rental, the monthly rental, of medical equipment that the physician deems to be medically necessary for your particular condition. And that would include oxygen delivery systems, CPAP for sleep apnea, nebulizers, and also the solutions that go into the nebulizers. And I'll clarify that more when we get into the prescription drug benefit. So the Medicare Part B program, as I mentioned, there is only 80%. It'll pay 80% of what they call the Medicare allowed amount for that particular procedure. And Medicare has rates that they establish, and as long as the provider is accepting assignment, it means they accept that as payment in full. Well, if Medicare is only paying 80%, we have to pay the 20%. 
And what most of us do, at least myself included, my wife, is we purchase a Medigap insurance policy, or what they call a Medicare supplement. We usually get it from ARP because they are the most uh, competitive in terms of price. And then that coinsurance pays for the 20%. So my doctor bills Medicare for 80%, then they turn around and bill my coinsurance for the 20%. And that's how that Medicare Part B plan works. So you do have an outlay for the monthly premium that's usually withheld from your social security check. And then you also have the outlay for the Medicap insurance. But again, it's a lot less expensive to do that than to have to pay privately out of your pocket. So when you want these people to accept assignment, that's a very important term. What that means is they accept as payment in full Medicare approved amount. Now, if they do not accept assignment, what you have to be careful for is that they will charge you the difference between what their retail price is and what the Medicare allowable is. And you don't want to go there because that would be money out of your pocket. So you want to make sure that you go to physicians and clinics that accept Medicare assignment. That means they accept the Medicare approved amount as payment in full and it limits your out of pocket exposure. All right. now. Uh, starting April of this year, Medicare started mailing new Medicare cards. And most of you may have already received them. They're rolling it out in different parts of the country. We just received ours in California about three weeks ago. And they started mailing them out in April. And the big important thing is here is that the number that you now have is unique to you. Prior to these cards, that number, what was that number? Does anybody know what that number was? Your Social Security number. And with all the scallywags out there scamming, we don't want our social security number out there as, many, as, as often as it is. And it's all over the place when you're doing Medicare billing. So those days are gone. We're now all gonna have our unique Medicare number, unique to us only. And if you haven't had received your card yet, I'll show you how you can go and find out where it is. You should receive it in the mail automatically as long as your address is still current with the Medicare people. And if you're getting your social security check, uh, de delivered to your home, your address is, is okay and current. If it's going directly to your bank account, you may have physically moved, you want to make sure that your address is current to get that card. And you got to be very careful because now the scammers are taking advantage of this. They're basically calling people and saying, we have your Medicare card and you have to send us 20 bucks to transfer it over. And some people are falling for that and I think it's horrible. At the same time, you want to make sure that you don't answer cold calls because I'll tell you now, Medicare will only call you in response to a phone call that you made to Medicare in the first place. Medicare will never do a cold call on anybody who is on Medicare. So any type of a cold call, hang up. At the same time, make sure you only give your number to people who you trust, name your physician and your uh, home care company and your laboratory and your x-ray department. Make sure that these are legitimate payers who you've already worked with in the past and be wary of that because people use those numbers and they do fraudulent billing and then of course it ruins the benefit for the rest of us. So that Medicare card is an important change and to try and protect us from identity theft. Now Medicare Part C. Uh, some of you may be enrolled in a Medicare Advantage program, but what this really is, there are private insurance companies that contract with Medicare, with the Medicare, to provide services to a defined population in a community. Now let me just give you an example. I live in Fullerton, California, population of about 220,000 people. And so what ha would happen is that there's three hospitals in Fullerton, they would join together along with the physician groups and they would create this legal entity, Fullerton Hot Stuff Medicine. And what they would do is they would contract with Medicare, and Medicare would give them a payment each month, one payment each month, to provide all the health care services that a Medicare person would want if they joined that Advantage program. And so basically, they would, Medicare would no longer, for the people in that program, they wouldn't get a bill from the DME company, they wouldn't get a bill from the hospital, they wouldn't get a bill from the doctor's office, they wouldn't get a bill from outpatient. They would send one check once a month for all health care services. And so there's a real attractiveness to that because Medicare likes to deal with one entity versus 15 or 20 different entities. Now, the problems are that basically they pay a monthly fee and they agree, the entity, to provide all the benefits that are currently available under Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B. That's the minimum requirement. But just as I set up my program in Fullerton, 
there might be a competitor in the next city that wants to compete with me. And the only way they can compete with me, they're going to get the same amount of money, is offer more benefits. And so what you find them doing is actually including non-covered benefits such as vision care, or hearing care, or actually membership in a gym to be able to promote physical health and wellness. See, so these Medicare Advantage plans compete with each other to try and get the Medicare enrollees to sign up. And what they do is they basically also provide prescription drug, and that's usually included. So when you join one of these Advantage plans, you don't have to worry about buying the prescription drug plan. So it is a cost savings, and there are some trade-offs, however. Uh, you are uh, continued to be a member. When you join one of these Advantage plans, they call you a member. You're no longer a beneficiary. It's like you're joining a club. And the reality is that you are also obliged to continue to pay your Part B premium. That's one of the conditions. And at the same time, there's a limited network. If you go outside of that network, you're not going to get covered. So you have limited options. You're pretty much identifying that you're going to be using the hospitals and the doctors in that system at that particular geographic area. So there are some trade-offs. And as we heard before, it's all about balancing the benefit with the risk and with the cost. And that's what Medicare Advantage programs are. There are the new and improved HMOs. Many of you were probably around back in the 1980s when the HMOs came on the market. And they didn't last too long. Uh, they kind of faded away real quick. And the reason was is because what those three letters stood for, HMO. Health, Health maintenance organization, well, not really. How many obstacles? Because they denied, denied, denied. And they didn't ration, but they limited utilization through inconvenience. See, so the HMOs kind of didn't really work that well. Uh, the new Advantage plan, they're giving incentives to the plans to try and make them more competitive. And so you need to real look at that on your own reality. And you may have some slight co-pays. Each plan is different, but you have to do your due diligence. Now, this is the newest kid on the block. This just became effective in 2006. This is the Medicare Part D called the Prescription Drug Plan. And I'm sure some of you are having some fun with this, and some of you are probably having a lot of anxiety with this. And I'll explain why that is. First of all, these plans, these prescription drug plans, are offered by private commercial insurance companies that are approved by Medicare to meet certain requirements. And what they're going to do is pretty much process claims for your prescription drugs. And the way it works, you purchase one of these plans, and there is about 300 different plans across the country, and the, the monthly fee is anywhere from $35 to $60 a month. That's what it was last year when my wife and I were looking for our benefits. And the higher the monthly cost, the more coverage you have especially with branded drugs. The lower the cost, monthly cost, the least options you have, and more generics are being approved. So you have to kind of decide what medications you're on, which ones are available in the generic form, and then select that plan for that coming year. The problem is, at the end of each year, each plan changes their formulary based upon what the utilization was. So what was covered last year might not be covered next year. So you have to really do your homework to stay current to make sure that your drugs that were covered this year are covered next year. And the way it works is that you take your prescription to a pharmacy, and the pharmacy will fill the prescription, and then essentially what they will do is they will go ahead and pay the uh, pharmacy. The insurance company will pay the pharmacy. And what the insurance company is doing is they're keeping a tab starting the 1st of January, and they write down how many prescriptions were refilled for each individual and how much it cost. And then when they add that up and they get to this amount, this was the amount for 2018, $3,750 of total prescription drug cost, everything stops. You then fall, you get a notice from Medicare and they say, you are now in the coverage gap. Uh, by the way, we refer to that as the donut hole. You're all familiar with that. And what that means is that you now have to pay privately, even though it is somewhat discounted, you have to pay privately cash on the barrelhead to get all those prescriptions refilled. And some of those prescriptions are very expensive, especially the inhalers that we'll talk about. Now, here's the problem. You have to continue to pay privately until you, the beneficiary, your total out-of-pocket expenses reach $5,000. That was the level for 2018. That'll probably be up a bit in 2019. We don't know where that's coming from yet. Now, here's the problem. It's what you have paid out of your pocket. 
you have to reach $5,000. Of that $3,750, you're paying 25% of that. The insurance company is paying 75%. That doesn't count toward the 5,000. You go from your 950, which is 25% of 3,750, up to 5,000, and when you're in that donor hole and you're on a fixed income, you can't fill your prescriptions, and that's not good. Now, I want to tell you something that I hope will, will come to fruition. Everybody in Washington now, the administration and Congress, we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. We're going to do this, 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 and this, and they're still arguing. Uh, what happens is important, but we're on Medicare. So whatever they talk about in terms of Medicaid work requirements and pre-existing conditions and uh, what health insurance plans should cover, we're removed from that by being on Medicare. But at the same time, one of the proposals of the Affordable Care Act, or as they call it, Obamacare, was to close that donut hole by 2020. And I don't think anybody in Washington in their right mind is going to try and be an obstruction to that because ARP would be all over them. So good news, the donut hole is going to start closing in 2019. It's going to get smaller. And then by 2020, it's going to be gone assuming the people in Washington leave it the way it's supposed to be in the Affordable Care Act. And I haven't heard anything about repeal and replace the donut hole provision. So that's good news. So that's down the road, something to look forward to, especially if you're on a lot of prescription drugs. The last thing, all inhalers, whether they're your puffer or the dry powdered inhalers, they're covered under Medicare Part D. And as I mentioned, they're quite expensive. So getting that donut hole to close is a real important issue for us. Now, Couple of important dates when you're on Medicare. Starting October 15th, just another couple of days away, is what we call the open enrollment. And from October 15th to December 7th, you have to do your homework. That's open enrollment. That's when you make all your changes. That's, for example, when you review your Medicare Part B supplemental insurance plan. Maybe you can get a less expensive one, but that's the time to do it, is to review it, because all these changes will become effective January 1st. At the same time, that's where you're now going to review your prescription drug plan. And you'll get, you're probably already getting information in the mail from your insurance companies telling you what's covered for 2019. You need to go through that and measure up what you're covered in 2018 and make sure that the coverage continues and your drugs are listed in 2019. It's not easy to do, but you've got to take the time to do it. This is also the time, if you were in an Advantage plan, and you just realize, it's not working for me, I want to go back to my original Medicare, this is the time you make that decision. At the same time, some Medicare people say, you know, I want to try that Advantage plan. This is the time where you make that decision. So this open enrollment is a very important time to decide what 2019 coverage is going to be like for various elements of the Medicare program. And it's very important that you take advantage of that because you don't have an opportunity once that enro open enrollment period closes. Now, more important dates, a couple of more important dates. First of all, in mid-October, probably another two weeks from now, we're going to hear from the federal government what the cost of living adjustment, or COLA, is to Social Security check, to your Social Security check. And interestingly enough, and this is kind of going to be pretty, pretty true, it looks like they're estimating that in 2018 or 2019, we're probably going to get about 2.7 to a 3% bump in our Social Security check. Now, that's what they're predicting. And I think it's probably going to come close to 3% because of the metrics that they've been using and how improved the economy is for the last six months. As it turns out, 3%, if you're getting a Social Security check for $1,500 a month, I'm just picking a number, that's about $45 a month more. That's almost $500 a year more. See, so this 3% is going to be a significant improvement, and that will be announced sometime within the next week or so. Also, in mid-November, this 2018, Medicare will tell us what the Part B premium will be for 2019. All right, so that's the second part where the shoe has to fall. So not only do they tell us what the cost of living is going to be for our Social Security check, but they're also telling us what the Part B premium will be for 2019. And I'll show you how we'll have to balance that in a moment. At the same time, on January 1st, January 1st is when open enrollment takes effect. That's when the new adjustment to your Social Security becomes effective, whatever it is. And that's also when the new Part B premiums kick in. Now, here's the trade-off. On one hand, we're getting an increase in our Social Security check. And on the other hand, they're kind of slipping it out by increasing the Part B premium. 
And that's really kind of, uh, you know, we'll give it to you, but we'll take it away immediately. It's kind of typical government, you know, smoke and mirrors. Well, the nice thing about it is they pretty much have said, and we have to wait until we actually hear it in firm writing, that they don't anticipate increasing the Part B premium in 2019. But that's why I have a question mark here. I'll believe it when I see it. Because here's what happened in this year. In 2017, we got a 2% increase in our Social Security check for this year. And so they did a survey, ARP did a survey of 3,500 Medicare people, and they asked them, how much of an increase did that 2.5% result in your check each month? And look at this. Some said it was actually 7% lower. 7% said it was lower than it was the year before. I actually lost money with the increase. And then some people said, said it was the same. Some people said I got about five bucks. And the reason that there was this is because they also raised the Part B premium. See, so we have to be careful. We can't get too excited about the bump until we know what the Part B premium is going to be. Begging from Peter to pay Paul. So those are important dates that you want to be aware of. All right, now, what are some of these changes? Uh, first of all, between the years uh, 2011 and 2025, two and a half million people turn 65 each year. All right, that's 2.5 million people a year between the years 2011 to 2026 who turn 65 and become eligible for Medicare. When you take all those years times 2.5 million, it means that the Medicare population is doubling. In other words, we're the fastest lowest growing demographic in the United States right now. And that's why Medicare said back in the 2007, 2008, we've got to change the way that we pay for health care services. Because we're having a significant explosion in the number of people coming into the Medicare program. And then because of all this wonderful medical technology, people in the Medicare program are living longer. But at the same time, we have to realize the budgetary constraints. So Medicare decided to kind of change the way that they were going to pay hospitals for providing care. And they're also going to change how physicians are going to be paid. And they're also going to change how they're going to pay for durable medical equipment. And they're also changing how they're going to pay skilled nursing facilities. So what they're doing is they're essentially saying, we are now going to expect some proof that the care that you have given our patients, our beneficiaries, are actually working. We want to make sure that you're getting paid for providing quality, safe care, and the outcomes are what we expect. Because under the old system, which is being replaced, it was called fee for service. And that simply meant the more things you do, the more you bill, the more you get paid. And it would be nice if everybody got better. Some people did, but people advanced lung problems, people with disabilities, maybe they stayed the same, and sometimes they got worse. And to, not to be a cynic, but if they got worse, we'll bring them back into the hospital, and we'll readmit them, and we'll do more things, and charge more. See, there was no accountability. And that's why the Affordable Care Act in 2010 pretty much codified these changes that Medicare had been talking about for the last seven to eight years to anticipate what they call the baby boomer tsunami. And so those changes are dealing with changing how hospitals are going to be paid to incentivize hospitals to do things differently than they've done in the past, and at the same time, to also cause physicians to be a little bit more accountable for what they do. Do hospitals and physicians like this? Absolutely not, because we're completely upsetting 50 years of traditional practice. But Medicare is saying, we believe in the golden rule. Those that have the gold make the rules. And what's their doing? And they have every understanding that when you change the requirements for how money flows, you change behavior. And that's what this is all about, is changing behavior. Now, they also identified that from now on, and again, I'm not being unkind to physicians, but traditionally, the physician is the most important part of the health care team. They're the ones legally empowered to prescribe medications and to do all those things that they have to do because of safety guidelines and because of legal guidelines and medical ethics and so forth. And there's no question the physician is at the top of the, uh, the order calling. But now Medicare is saying for people with chronic conditions that are not curable but they're controllable, those patients need to be more active. They need to be more involved in the care. And so they've come up with this term called patient-centric. And you heard 
earlier this morning, we need to make sure that the care is individualized, that it's appropriate for you. And that's what this patient-centric care means. It means that we take into account the patient's goals and their preferences. And patients, therefore, need to get more energized and get more active in their care. And that requires people like yourself coming to a program like this, where you can get more information and be more empowered. But this patient-centric care is changing the dynamics. Because sometimes in the past, when you went for a second opinion, say 15 years ago, you, well, I don't want to hurt my doctor's feelings. He, I don't want to get a second opinion. I trust my doctor. And that was all well and good, but this is a new environment we're in today, and now Medicare wants to make sure you pick the hospital and the doctor that's right for you. Now, what's happening is they're linking the payment to the outcomes of care. So it's increased the reporting requirements. In other words, hospitals and physicians now have to submit monthly reports to, to Medicare for the patients they've taken care of. And Medicare is tabulating that evidence or that information and saying, this is a good hospital, this is a good doctor, this hospital's not so good, this doctor's not so good. And they're publicizing that information. They're basically saying, we want transparency. If we're going to have a change in healthcare, we have to have transparency. And it's a big, big issue. Quality reporting. The financial rewards are, what they're basically doing is they're doing what they call the carrot and stick approach. From Aesop's fable, you got this stupid donkey, stubborn mule, and you want the mule to move. And you pick up a stick and you you put a rope on it, you try and pull them, the mule's stubborn, you pick up a stick and you, you whop them on the rump and they're still there. The smart person says, let me take that rope, tie it to the end of the stick, tie a carrot to it, and then hold it out in front of the donkey. The donkey will go after the carrot. Now, the carrot in this case is extra money, above and beyond what we've already paid you because we're going to reward you because your outcomes are superior. And where we're going to get that money from? Well, this hospital over here, their outcomes weren't so good, we're going to penalize them. We're going to take money from them, we're going to give it to these people. Now, that's called revenue neutral in Washington. That's why there's no talk of repeal and replace any one of these changes in payment, because it's self-sustaining. Are some of the poor hospitals going to close? Probably so. Some already have. Some have merged and joined other hospitals. But this is now fleshing out. It's really changing the dynamics of how hospitals are competing with one another in the community. Financial reward, and at the same time, penalize the others. Penalties for the hospital. Since 2012, hospitals now get penalized up to 3% of their total Medicare payments if they have excessive readmissions back to the hospital following treating the patients for their acute flare-up. In other words, you come into the hospital, you're in bad shape. You come into the ED. They put you up on the floor. You're in the hospital for five and a half days. And they say, well, you know, maybe in four days we'll send you home. In four days, you go home, but you're not quite ready. But we wanted to get rid of you because, you know, you, you need to go home. You're, you're better off in your home. And you go home, and you're not quite ready. And about a week later, you have a relapse. You come back to the hospital. And that's the way it was in the old days. Fantastic. It's another round of reimbursement for the hospital visit. And now Medicare added all up and said about, about 20 22% of all the admissions that we paid for to the tune of about $20 billion a year, a lot of them are avoidable. The patients weren't properly prepared to go home. They weren't properly prepared with the resources they need. They weren't aware of what they needed to do for their self-care. So this is changing the dynamics of how the hospitals are treating their patients. There's much more education. There's much more follow-up. There's more offering of resources. And pretty soon, the hospitals are going to be expected to be out in the community in storefronts promoting healthy living styles talking about smoking cessation, proper nutrition, exercise for children, to try and stop some of these chronic conditions that are the result of poor choices that we make early in life. The old catcher for the New York Yankees, Yogi Berra, once said, if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. And I think we all regret that at some point in time. All right, now, public disclosure. Now let's look real quick. This is the resource that you want to use. This is the resource you want to use to find out about Medicare. The old adage, you can, uh, someone who's hungry, you can feed them, and it only takes a short term to make a difference, or you can teach them how to fish, and that way you solve the problem. I'm going to teach you how to fish. I want you to go on that website, and I'm going to lead you through that website right now and show you how important. This website is strictly for us, for Medicare beneficiaries. There's a separate one out there for the doctors, for the hospitals, and the therapists. This is for us. And basically, when you go to the website, this is what the page looks like. This is the home page. 
And I'll go through this in sequence, but it's kind of small to see. So I'm just going to go to the top part right here. All right, let's take a look at what the top part is. Now notice right here, new Medicare. If you haven't received your Medicare card, go to that website and click on that, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about getting your new Medicare card. At the same time, you can see here across the top all these tabs. I'm going to go ahead and show you a resource. I'm going to click this tab up here, and when you click that tab, you get this drop-down menu. And when you get the drop-down menu, I want you to see this Medicare resource guide. That's something you want to have your kids or your grandkids download for you because it's a beautiful book. It creates all the new Medicare issues for 2019. A lot of what I presented here today is included in that book. So it's a great resource for you, and you should get someone to get you a printed copy. And it's easily downloadable from the website. All right, now, back onto the website. This is the front page again. We've uh, looked up here, and here's where you can look your, uh, for your Medicare card. Now look at this right down here, in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. Find someone to talk to. So what I did is I just typed in Colorado. I don't know why, I just happened to pick that state. So I typed in Colorado, and then you hit enter, and what happened, 57 different contacts that are available for citizens in Colorado to get information about Medicare. I've just listed nine of them here. But it's an exhaustive list of resources and websites and addresses that you can use to solve the issues that you run into in the state of Colorado. So you have a ready-made resource. So again, it's real easy. Just type in the state and pit go, and then you'll get all the things. And what they're saying here is there are 57 contacts in the state of Colorado. Now, at the same time, we see here how to find doctors and how to find hospitals. And so what I'll do here is I'll go ahead and I'll click this one. And you see basically here, here's hospital compare and here's physician compare. This is how Medicare wants you to select your hospital and your doctor. What they're trying to do is to make sure that you are getting the best possible. And I'll show you how it works. Basically, they want to offer you choices. They want you to be able to see who the good providers are, who the poor providers are, all about improving quality, publicize the results, and all about reducing costs. Now let's take a look at how you can choose a hospital. Basically, this is hospital compare. So what I did, because I know my community, I typed in my zip code and my closest hospital, which happened to be St. Jude. And then you hit enter, and this is what you get. And this is St. Jude Hospital, here's the information. But notice all these tabs across the top. You click on any one of those tabs, and all the information about their quality data, how much they charge, how much Medicare pays them, what their uh, rate is in terms of patient falls, what their infection rate is. See, all that information is out there. Do hospital administrators like this? I can virtually say probably not. But the reality is Medicare is now publicizing that information and the same thing that you can get for your physician as well. Now, let's talk about this competitive bidding. That's the 500 pound gorilla in the room. That's where Medicare decided they were gonna change how much they're paying and how they're paying for durable medical equipment. The program was actually first started in 2008. It was on a limited process of rollout and then it finally got its full implementation in 2016. And the whole concept was, we want the DME providers of home oxygen and compressors and nebula, we want them to bid against one another. A silent auction. And what we're gonna do, Medicare says, in the one area, we're gonna take all the bids and we're gonna come up with a reasonable amount based upon what you, the DME companies, told us you can provide that equipment for. And the idea was, was to lower cost. And so what they would do is they would go ahead and then accept what they call the median bids, those are the ones in the middle, and then they would offer award contracts. And the people who got the contract offer, if they signed that contract, <clears throat> then they got all the Medicare business in that area for that agreed price. If you're a non-contracted company, you could not bill Medicare. See, so basically it kind of limited your options. The idea was we wanted to try and just reduce the overall cost. At the same time, it really was a draconian cut anywhere from 30 to 50% reduction in the overall reimbursement rates for DME companies across the country. Now, the key elements, and this is something very important because of some significant changes. What they did in this, they made an assumption, and they said the useful life of a piece of medical equipment is 60 months, five years. But we're only gonna pay three years or 36 months rental. And then the pay, the company is they're going to continue to service the equipment for the next 24 months and if it breaks replace it but no additional cost no additional payments it was called cap rental and so it was really kind of the idea was well I'm not going to get as much and it's going to be cap but I get all the business so I'll make make it up in volume 
Well, when you're losing a little bit of money on small patients, you lose a lot of money when you have a lot of patients. And that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. As you can see here, there was a major, major problem, and there was only payments for a portable at $12 a month. And as you can see, that's very, very low. So what went wrong? What went wrong with competitive bidding? Well, first of all, restrict it your choice. You can only go with a contracted provider, and sometimes there wasn't one in your area, and the local company was not always a contracted provider. It also, the low bids rate were not sustainable, especially in rural areas where transportation costs were huge because of great distance to be traveled. At the same time, we saw that we had some real problems with some suppliers closing their doors. I can't stay in business. And other providers kind of bent the rules a little bit. Uh, they're supposed to be able to provide everything that doctor ordered if they got the bid, but then they would tell the patient, well, you know, Medicare doesn't cover that. We don't have liquid oxygen, it's not covered. And all that was an incorrect assumption. But the problem was the damage was done. We had limited access to li liquid oxygen and portable concentrators and difficulty in providing ambulatory oxygen. So what happened? Time for a timeout. Remember timeouts when you're raising your kids and grandkids now? All right, current contracts expire this December 31st, the ones that are in play for this year. They're not being renewed. Essentially what Medicare is doing is they're taking a two-year timeout, effective January 1st of this year for two years, to redo the concept, to redo how they're going to bid in the future, to kind of resurrect the program. And at the same time, I should point out that several organizations, including physician groups and the American Lung Association, have written to Congress and to Medicare and said, use this opportunity to do something right for liquid oxygen, because the current system is hurting liquid oxygen, and it, it should be exempt, because it's a completely different thing than a concentrator. So what happened is they're going to remain in effect for the next two years. That means that right now, you can choose any willing DME supplier. There's no more just contracted suppliers. The problem is you have to be very careful because if you're currently with an existing contracted supplier and you've been in his business for 30 months and you want to go to another contracted provider, they're only going to get six months reimbursement and then they're going to have to service your equipment for 24 months. They're probably not going to want to take you. So for new patients, not a problem. But if you're on an existing process with a current contracted provider, you gotta be real careful if you wanna switch. After the 60 month period, no problem. You go right ahead and switch. All right, now, in terms of questions about home oxygen, here's back to that top page. Notice in here, I typed in home oxygen, and then all these quip and questions about home oxygen pop up. This is on your website, and it's in plain English about what your rights are and where you can go and what you can say to your supplier. So it really is an important point. Uh, these are all the things. For example, can my oxygen supplier change my equipment or the number of tank refills I get each month without talking to my doctor? And the answer is no. And the information is right here. Uh, what happens if an oxygen supplier goes out of business? And that's important. These are questions that they've resolved and you can get all those answers for yourself. Now I'm gonna finish up by talking about inhaled medications because we talked about Medicare Part B and Medicare Part D. There are three ways that you can inhale a medication. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Here's a nebulizer, here's your puffer, and here's a dry powdered inhaler. And they all have benefits and disadvantages. For example, the nebulizer is least convenient because you need a power source. But the new ones have a battery. And they can also be used in a motorhome or in a car. Uh, they are easy to use, and not only is a device, but the liquid medications that go into the nebulizer are covered under Medicare Part B. And remember, that's an advantage for you. As it turns out, the meter dose inhaler is more convenient, it's self-contained, but it's more difficult to use. More importantly, it's under Medicare Part D. So it's gonna be a lot of money out of your pocket. At the same time, the dry powdered inhalers are convenient, they're self-contained, they're more, most difficult to use, and also covered under Part D. So I gotta tell you, having your medications delivered with a nebulizer under Medicare Part B is financially in your best interest. So it's something you should think about. We'll come back, we'll come back to that in a moment. No more questions, I have to move on, I'm getting my time here, and we'll open it. Write your question down, please. This is the new home nebulizers, ease of use, inconvenience, and infection control issues. Some doctors don't like home nebulizers. Back in the past, they had bad experiences with it, and I'll show you how we address those, especially infection control. It's very easy to be compliant today and keep your nebulizers clean. There's also problems with secretions. And now we have devices out there that you can use at home to help remove secretions or help loosen secretions so you can get them up and out. And these devices are called OPEP devices. And the nice thing about these new devices, they're so well manufactured that when it comes to cleaning them, they can go into the top shelf of the dishwasher. 
You can wash all the parts and then take a pot of boiling water off the stove and dunk them into boiling water. But what I've learned from my daughter-in-law with our new granddaughter, baby bottle, Dr. Brown's microwave sterilizer for baby bottles. And instead of baby bottles, you put your nebulizer parts, your OPEP parts in there, you put a cup of water in, put it in the microwave for five minutes, everything is completely steam autoclaved. Every bug is killed. No problems with infection control. This costs $25 at Target. And it really is a much easier way to take care of infection control. All right, finishing up. Living with COPD. No smoking, no vaping. You've got already all the information you need. And that includes secondhand smoke, secondhand vapor. Basically, take your prescribed beds as directed. No interruptions. You're on these medications for the rest of your life. When you start feeling good, that does not mean you stop taking your meds. The reason you're feeling good is because your meds are working. So you have to be able to afford them. So consequently, it might be necessary for you to consider going to a different delivery source that's covered under Part B. Demand the best delivery device. It's patient-centric. You have the right to determine what's best for you. Get your annual flu shot. Again, already mentioned you'll be able to get it here at lunchtime. And also your pneumococcal shots. Very important that you protect yourself against the flu and from pneumonia. At the same time, a balanced diet. You know, proper amount of protein, vegetables, and fruits, and nuts and grains. And make sure you do try and balance your diet. Also, keep moving. I can't stress that enough. Pulmonary rehab was already stated as being very, very important. But I'll tell you what we're doing out in the West Coast. Kaiser has found out that if you get COPD patients who, at a minimum, walk 30 minutes a day, five days of the week, they have a much better outcome than people who don't. Now, that's minimum. If you can do better than that, fantastic. But that you got to keep moving and get active in advocacy. You're here today. You heard that the Colorado Society is going to have a patient active session. And I just saw this brochure that's being passed out from this uh, Breathe Strong COPD, Breathe Strong America. This is fantastic. I read this. Everything I talked about in my presentation is contained in here. This is a great resource. And it keeps you involved. It keeps you engaged. And at the same time, it allows us to stay. And speak up especially with your doctor. If it's patient-centric, that means your needs are to be known. And I end up by telling you that have a contact with your doctor, like was said, have a plan. And these are the three warning signs that you need to talk to your doctor. You're more short of breath today than you were yesterday. Or you're coughing more now than you were the last few days. Or you have changes in your sputum or your phlegm. It's thicker or it's changing color. Have an appointment and have a research with your doctor. Keep moving. No smoking, no vaping, take meds, eat a balanced diet, and speak up. And with that in mind, let me go ahead and again thank the program committee for inviting me to be here today. And now we'll open it up for Q&A. Anybody raise those hands if you've got cards. Yeah, just pick up cards. Raise your hands. You had a question, yeah. Okay, can we give her? Can't hold on. Are there more Yes. Well, she's going to ask. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. When I get my new Medicare card, which I just got, will that automatically be updated at the hospital? Yes, it has been. I, that was my question. I, for example, when I went to get my flu shot. Yeah. They already had it in the system. So okay, Medicare so has already to went to the about... Medicare providers who have provided service to you yeah. and updated that number. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. All right. We have a question here now. Uh, let's look at this one here. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any information on this. What do I have on the new Medicare Plan F being advertised? Uh, I must say that's news to me, but I'll certainly research it, and I'll be able to put the answer back on your resource site because I haven't heard that yet, but it's certainly something that I will address. Uh, question? Hi, I, I went on Medicare September 1st, and they took my $134 out, which was fine, but this month I got it bounced back for $268, and I have no idea why. Now, you're, are you new to Medicare? Yes. All right, what they're probably doing is retro billing for changes. Did you join Part B when you joined Medicare Part A? Yes. Okay. I, there's probably some adjustment to what the amount should have been. Are you employed? Are you working still? No. Okay. You might want to call Social Security and ask them to explain what that bump was. It might only be a one-time bump. 
to, pack, to kind of mix, make up for some other short billings in the past, but you should not have that type of increase. There's nobody that I'm aware of that's over $200 a month. No, no, they gave it back to you. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> what happens is that sometimes when, here's, here's what happens is people don't sign up for Part B when they go on Medicare because I don't need it, I'm still working, I don't take any meds. And the longer you wait to sign up for Part B, the higher the premium later on. And that's why some people are charged much, much more than the 135. I misunderstood your question, I'm sorry. No, if you got money back, it's probably that they're estimating that they were charging you too much. Yeah, if it's in your favor, I wouldn't call. Okay. Okay. Now remember, I'm between you, yoga, and lunch. And so we'll go at 12.15. If we don't get through them all, I'll answer them on the website. Can you use the bottle sterilizer for your face mask? I think you probably could. You want to check with the manufacturer. Most of the new face masks... Uh, are pretty effective, but I wouldn't want to say yes for sure. I'd go ahead and ask the manufacturer or your supplier who's ever given you that mask. Some of the new nice uh, vinyl ones are very, very durable, but others might not survive the high temperature. But though the plastic that's used in the manufacture of that nebulizer and that OPEP do, serve, do very well in the microwave. Good question. Check with your CPAP supplier. Okay, uh, here we go. Okay, the, the Medicare card, the new Medicare card. If you didn't receive it, it's not to worry. Remember, their plan is to have started April 1st, 2018, and have everybody have the new one by April not 2019. So the process is still in play. But go on that website and click on that banner that says new Medicare card and see what information you can get there. But don't, don't be too panicky because, again, we just got ours like two weeks ago. All right, so it's coming. It's just a matter of being patient. All right, Liquid O2 is very difficult when traveling across the U.S. Can one hunt for different providers? That's a very, very important question because unfortunately there is no network right now. We need to have a network of providers. Right now the only option that you have if you have liquid oxygen is to have your home care company offer you a list of companies in different towns that you're going to to try and help you out because they would know what to look for. But unfortunately, we don't have a system set up that's nationally available that would allow someone to go with liquid oxygen. And that's why the portable concentrator is being observed as basically an alternative. But sometimes that's not going to be enough. And liquid oxygen is what you need. And that's why you need to speak up and talk to your liquid oxygen supplier. And if they give you any difficulty, a little call to your doctor to have them or somebody from the doctor's office make the call to help you live your life normally. It might help you. Okay, can I go to Medicare.com and learn what medicine is already paying for me, uh, like MD charges oxygen company? The answer is yes. I don't know if they'll have it specifically for you, but they'll tell you what their rate is for the hospital, for the readmission, for your disease, for your diagnosis. Uh, to find out what is paying for you, you go to your prescription drug plan and just ask for an itinerary, just ask for an out, a printout of all your drugs for the last 12 months or the last 18 months. Your HME company, the same thing. Medicare should be sending you each month some type of a statement telling you what they paid, what the provider billed, and that's how you can evaluate indeed whether or not everything is, is indeed correct for you. Uh, if I have Kaiser now, how can I switch O2 carrier and not use Apria, Medicare Kaiser? Uh, that's what you're going to have to do. Uh, see, again, that's a, that's a Medicare Advantage plan. And the Medicare Advantage plan has total authority and responsibility. They contract, in this particular case, with APRIA. And they probably contracted at a very, very, uh, well, to the Advantage plan, like for Kaiser, very favorable, but not for the APRIA. So you're going to have to be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. You have to have a face-to-face, speak-up conversation with whoever your contact is with Kaiser and let them know that you're dissatisfied, that this company, this contracted company, is not meeting your needs. And it might lead you to think of looking elsewhere than Kaiser. So you have to use the leverage. Kaiser doesn't want you to leave. But if their contracted supplier is creating problems for you, they would want to take advantage and fix that. 
See, so you really need to speak up and you have to be very specific and very particular as to what your concerns are. Can you speak to the issue of the availability of POCs now for patients without having to be tested if the patients can tolerate them? Well, a big thing has happened on the way to the portable oxygen concentrated market. The technology is expanding tremendously and they're getting smaller and they're getting more efficient. Problem is, Medicare does not look at them as anything other than a traveling device or as a portable device. And it's not being paid for very much. So what's happened is that these companies are now selling portable concentrators directly to the consumer. And you're basically buying it and paying cash on the barrelhead. And supposedly, they have a contract with someone in the community to take care of it. But that's one of the problems with this competitive bidding is they did not take advantage in the competitive bidding of the technology of portable concentrators. And since competitive bidding, there's a whole bunch more out there. And they're all very, very different. And some of them are very, very good. But right now, they're much, they're three, four times more expensive than a regular 40 pound concentrator. When you reduce that down to 10, 15 pounds, you really kind of have to have a unique technology. But it really does offer a great option for some people. But unfortunately, hopefully with this time out, Medicare will recognize this is another area that doesn't quite fit into that big competitive bidding box that they were talking about. We can only hope. We can only hope. All right, is Kaiser Permanente a Medicare private insurance plan provider? Yes, the answer is Kaiser is basically what you call a Medicare Advantage plan. When you go to Kaiser as a Medicare person, you're joining the Kaiser network. All right, how are we doing? I think we've got about time for one more, and then we have to kind of turn it over to my moderator here. Who is Oh, you have a question over here? Well, let's get the microphone over here. I'd just like to point out in the guide that we passed out on page five in your guide, we do address the specific Part B, Part D drug issue and how to go about that. And I just encourage you to work with your providers on that issue. And also on the last issue on the competitive bid on oxygen, there are two inserts in your uh, guides. One of them is a portable oxygen assessment. This was developed by the US COPD coalition. Bree Strong worked together with that coalition. On the front is a needs assessment of what your portable oxygen concentrator needs are. You go through that front page to identify what you need in terms of pulse, continuous, level, whatever. Then you take that form to your doctor and partner with your physician on the evaluation and ordering of what you need. I gotta tell you, that's the great word, partner. You know, you, I say demand and speak up, but you're really trying to partner. And when you're partners, you both have skin in the game, and that way it's a collaboration. Good word, partner with your physician other providers. Okay, I gotta turn it over to you. Okay.